talked a couple of weeks ago in regard that if you go on a trip, sometimes you have a list of essentials, things that you take that are vitally important for that journey, for that trip. I use some illustrations about some times when I have forgotten some very important things. Uh, how many of you, especially men in here, can relate to leaving your home and, uh, and forgetting your wallet? Anybody ever done that? Um, have you ever ordered food at a drive through or something and then went up to pay and then you're like, I got to go, and then you just drove off because you, you have no money? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you a quick story in regards to that. The, the night... Uh, actually, very early morning that my first child was born. Uh, my wife, shortly after delivery, said this to me. She pulled me close. I thought this was going to be one of those memorable times, you know, these sweet nothings that you're going to say that you're going you're to you're, you're want to write this down. This is going to be a, a sweet time to remember. She pulled me close and she said, get me something to eat. <laughs> She said, I'm starving to death. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am, as quick as I can. And I took off. And I'm talking about, we're, we're thinking, it's about 2 in the morning. I'm driving the, through, and I saw some lights on at like a Burger King or something. Don't judge me. But I, I saw the lights on, and I, I flew into the drive through I, I, I ordered, and for some reason they were open. And, and, and I pulled up to the window, and uh, the lady said, it'll be this much. And I remember I did have my wallet, but uh, um, I pulled out my, my, my uh, debit card, and I, and I handed it to her. And she said, I'm sorry, but we just shut off all that system. We can only take cash. Now, I didn't tell her at all that my wife had just had a baby, and I, maybe, maybe she could tell by the look on my face. I don't know. Uh, but she basically said, you know what? Don't worry about it. Here you go. And at, sometimes I would have argued with her, but at that moment I went, thank you, Jesus, and floored it and went back to the hospital. My wife was happy. I was even more happy. And in that particular instance, I didn't forget my wallet, but it, it was one of those instances where it reminded me of times when I have ordered food and then didn't have a wallet to pay for it, and uh, I, I had to vamoose a little bit. Sometimes we forget things that, that we really intend to have with us. And the sad reality is, is that we do that not just with little things that don't mean that much, but at times we actually do that with some of the most important things in our lives. People forget some very important things. People lay on a, on a deathbed and they begin to regret because they forgot to carry along in their journey some things that were essential. They forgot to prepare what was essential to life. And one of the greatest things about the Bible, not that it challenges us and not that it gives us truth, but it actually gives us what is important. Do you understand that many of us feel like we have to live life to find out what is important when God is actually trying to tell us before we live our life what is already important so that we don't waste a lot of time. We don't get sidetracked and have to figure things out. He, tells us what the most important things in life are if we want to have a kind of life that's enjoyable, that's fulfilling, that's satisfying, then we need to look to God's Word. And as we began a couple of weeks ago, when we look at this account of David, David gives us some great advice in verse number 5. If you notice it again, please. At the ending of the verse, the Bible says, So David prepared abundantly before his death. Can I remind all of us that when you die, it's too late to prepare for what comes after. It's done. You're done. Just like that trip when you realize you've forgotten it and you're already on the plane. It's too late to pack it now. It's too late to do anything about it now. And David understood something. If I'm going to do something for God, I've got to prepare before death comes my way. I'm going to tell you, if you want to have the kind of life that you want, and more than that, if you want to have the kind of life hereafter, you must prepare before you die. David poured his whole life into some things that I think we see very much illustrated in this passage. And very quickly, I want to remind you of the first thing. But we see four preparations to make in life. Four preparations that you and I need to make in our life. Here's the first one. If we're going to have the kind of life that we desire and the life that pleases the Lord, the first preparation we're going to have to make is we need to love the house of God. We need to love the house of God. I'm not going to belabor those things, but very quickly, just to remind you of what we talked about before, is that David's life was wrapped up into the house of God. He loved God's house. This whole passage, as we read it, speaks over and over and over about how David uh, loved the house of God and prepared toward that and gathered things for that. And it really, you could tell by this passage, this was something he was passionate about. Uh, do you understand that you know what's passionate to people by what they talk about. 
You know that guy at work that always talks about their sports team, that they get on your nerves whether they're winning or losing? They're the most important thing to them. It doesn't take you long to understand that that's important to them. Uh, all you grandparents in here, it doesn't take people long to know you're a grandparent. As you start talking about the little, the little people that can never do any wrong, you know, and I'll show you my adorable grandchild, you think, I've seen, you know, I've seen more adorable babies than that, but you wouldn't dare say that to them because they'll claw your face off literally, you know. Uh, it, 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 what's important to us will come out by what we talk about, and David's life is filled with the house of God, this importance to loving God's house and building God's house. By way of reminder here, we understand that how, why it was so important because we see that his faith, faith was inspired by it. He gives reference there to the altar, the birth offering. This is where sinful man met with a holy God. And it was a very thing that encouraged and, and inspired and strengthened his faith was the house of God. The next thing is that his finances were invested in it. Constantly you see that he prepared and gathered in abundance. He didn't give out of what was left over, but he, he, actually, he actually took all the wealth, all the excess, all the things that were uh, being gathered at his time during his reign to put into the house of God. He didn't God, uh, give God of his leftovers. He actually gave God out of what he had accumulated, and he did it in abundance. All of that was wrapped up into the house of God. His family was involved in it. Here he is passing off this job, this passion, this priority to his son. And it wasn't so much to get a job done, but his son understood the importance of building the house of God and his life having that as a part of it. Then we talked about how that, that his future was intertwined with it. David didn't know much. He didn't know the future. But he knew whatever was to come in his life, God's house would have a part to do in that. And I think that's a good thing to remember as Christians that you know, most people spend more time or plan to spend more time at a job than they do the church that they attend. Or span, plan to spend more time in the house they've purchased than the church they're going to. And I want to tell you, there is supposed to be a helpful blessing about having a legacy to the house of God. One of the things that David was not only passing on to Solomon wasn't a list of things to do, but he was actually leading Solomon to the door of the house of God. He said, one of the things I want to leave with you, son, is the priority and the promise and the preeminence and the place of God's house in your life. David said, this is important to me, and I want it to be important to you, not because this is my thing. And we hear so much about that today. That's not my thing, and I, this is my thing, and I enjoy this thing. This was not David's thing. What it was was that God had changed his life and transformed him, and God was the thing that had changed him, and he was passing on that dedication to his son. God had done something in his own life, and you can't look at the life of David without understanding that. The Psalms and even his own record of his reign and how God used and worked and moved in his life. You can't deny that God was in David's life everywhere. And his desire was that it was the same way in Solomon's life. One of the key focal points of what that would be was in the building of this house of God. So I want to ask you before we move on to the next thing, is how's your love for the house of God? You cannot say you love God without loving His things. If, you don't, if you're not faithful to God's house, then you're not really faithful to God. You need to love the things that God loves. I'm not saying this building, this carpet. I'm not saying that you love all the external superficial things, but what sets this place apart is that we have declared this is where we will collectively and publicly gather to worship our God. That's why it's a big deal. That's why you need that. That's why I need that corporate worship. That's not all of the worship that you need, but you do need corporate worship in your life of worship. It's part of God's plan for us. So number one, the first pre preparation that we need is that we need to love the house of God. Here's the second thing, though, some new territory for us today. We need to be led by the Word of God. Notice again in verse number 7 and verse number 8, if you would please. Verses 7 and 8, God's word says, And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. David had a lot of problems in his life. God highlights one of those to him. He said, you've shed blood. Uriah, you've killed him. You've taken his wife, Bathsheba, to be your wife. You murdered a man. 
Because you committed that sinful act, God says, the sword's not going to depart from your house. That was a consequence of his own sin. David understood that. He'd gone through that. He, he knew that was the consequence of his disobedience to God. And that's not what I want to focus on because we've all got issues. We've all got sin. We all have problems. And many of us, hopefully, we've asked God to forgive us of those things. But here's the part I want to emphasize that reveals a lot about how David responded to God. Is that, did you notice that in verse number 7, what did he say? He said, it was in my mind to build this house for God. It was in me. I thought this. This was my idea. This is my passionate thing that I wanted to do for God. I want to build this for God. And that's a good thing to do, isn't it? To, to build a house to God. Isn't he deserving of that? Isn't he worthy of that? Absolutely. And David was not going to, not gonna, uh, he, he was going to do right by God. He wasn't going to slide him in the least in this house that he wanted to build him. But here's the key. David said, in my mind, I wanted to do that, but the word of the Lord came unto me. And what God had in mind was different than what I had in mind. And here's how we know that David was led by the word of God is because instead of doing his own thing anyway, what did he do? He did what God told him to do. Oh, he was all consumed with this idea. God, I want to do this for you. I love you. I want to build this house for you. But God said, you can't do that. That's not what I have for you. And you know what he had to decide to do? Am I going to do my own thing or do the thing God has for me? Can I tell you, as a Christian, I think our life is going to be a constant struggle within ourself of choosing between doing my thing and the thing God has for me. <laughs> we have some pretty good ideas sometimes, don't we? I mean, don't you tell that to your spouse or to friends that you have? Hey, let me tell you this. I thought of this. What do you think? And we're fine when they agree with us, but the first person that disagrees with it, well, who asked you? you know? <laughs> what do you know anyway? You don't know anything about it. We get this idea that when people don't adopt the idea we have, we immediately get defensive and we take it personally. Now I'll translate that into this spiritual context david said god i want to do something for you after all this is for you this isn't about me this is nothing about me god i want to serve you i want to build something for you i want to worship you and god says that's not what i have for you and instead of david get all bent out of shape going well that's what i wanted to you and you're mean and you're hateful i'm gonna do it anyway god i'm gonna show you that it's gonna be the best house i can build for you instead of going against god doing something supposedly for God, you know what David ended up doing? He did what God gave him to do. He understood something that not every idea he has is what the idea God has for him. And can I tell you that this life that you and I live, well, the lessons that we're going to have to live as a, uh, learn as a Christian is not to repeal what God has for us because it's not really quite what we had in mind. Sometimes people come to God and to his house and even to a ministry and they, they want to do something. It's in them. They'll say things like that. That's my calling. That's, that's what I'm supposed to do here. And when something is contrary to that, instead of saying, you know what, if that's what God wants, fine, some people get mad about it. Some people will say things like this, then I'll find a church that will let me do what I'm supposed to do. Now, I'm not picking on anybody. I don't, I don't know if there's anybody even like that here. But what I'm saying is sometimes the thought we have, it's a good thing. It's a great thing. We think it's the greatest thing we could ever do. But we don't understand what God has for us. There's always a reason for what God does. Here in this passage, we're, we're blessed to know his reasoning for why he told David, I'm not going to let you do that. But here's the thing. The thing David had in his mind to do and was passionate about he still had opportunity to get in on that. He just wasn't the main factor in it. And I'm going to tell you that sometimes what we're going to have to do as a Christian is we're going to have to say no to self and say yes to what God has for us. If we're going to obey God, sometimes it means my idea is not going to be on the table. The way I think it should be done, it's not going to be done that way. But God's way is the best way. And what did he do? This is one of the greatest things I think we see about the attitude in the heart of David is that he adopted God's main thing to be his main thing. He didn't kick God's main thing to the curb because it didn't line up with his thing, but what God actually said, he grabbed onto it, made it his thing. He's pushing this, promoting this. He's excited about it, and he's telling Solomon not, 
Well, God, I wanted to do it for God and everything, but he told me no, so I guess you're going to have to do it, so good luck with that. No, he didn't have this bad attitude, and we do that, don't we? Well, I wanted to be in charge of that ministry, but you know, I'll help. I wouldn't do it that way, but I'll help. He's so sick of that. Like, we're, we're so selfish. We care more about what we want than what God wants for us. Like we think our way is the best way. Like the only way it can be done is the way that I thought up because after all, I'm right, aren't I, all the time. I know everything. I know the best way to be done. Hey, hey God, I, I know you had not thought of this, but I want to build this for you. And most people say things like this. They decide to do it anyway and they'll say things like this. Well, God knows my heart. And I think that's Christian lingo for saying I'm selfish, I'm going to do it my own way. And we'll figure it out later. I'm going to get my own way. I don't really care what God does, how God leads. Hey, can I remind all of us that one of the ways God shares his will and his ways with us is through people? Through other people? Hey, I'd beware of these people who think, hey, I got this idea. How'd you come up with that? I was just alone with my Bible. God gave it to me just one-on-one. -on -one. And you haven't talked to anybody else about it? Nope, don't need anybody else. Just me and God. You know? I'd worry about that. Uh, the Bible says that there's safety in a multitude of counselors. Sometimes we need to bounce those things off each other and say, oh, I don't really think that that lines up actually with Scripture. I don't think you should murder your husband. <laughs> I know you've got peace about that and probably going to have a lot more peace after you do that, but no, that's not God's will. I can pretty, pretty much say without a doubt, no, <laughs> don't do that. I mean, there's other ways to start a prison ministry than that way, you know? Don't, don't do that. I'm saying sometimes we don't really care what God wants us to do. Most people will say this. Well, God bless it. God help us in this. What they mean by that is it's not really God's idea, it's theirs, and they just want God to be on it, on it. God bless my way. Bless my thing. Bless my idea. It's for you, God. After all, it's for you. I think we're so guilty as Americans. We blame so much on God that really never has anything to do with him. We might put his name on a t-shirt with it, put a, put a wristband with it on it, but he's a million miles away. That's not what he wants. I don't know where you're at in your life, but the struggle we're all going to have to face from time to time is to be led by the word of God. Not by us, not by our word, what we think, but be led by the word of God. And then once we know what God wants, we show our obedience to it when we get all in it, like it was our idea. Hey, how passionate are you about the things you come up with? Are you just as passionate about the things somebody else comes up with? Hey, our church doesn't have a pastor, but when God leads a pastor here, are you going to be, hey, just because it's not your idea, are you still going to get all in it? Hey, just because you don't criticize it doesn't mean that you're in it. Are you, are you excited? Are you passionate about what God is doing when he does it his way and it happens to go against what you think or how you would prefer it be done? David had a passion. He was a passionate man. Read the Psalms. Here's a guy that would read things or write things that would make you weep. He would talk about weeping. He was a man that was full of passion. What does he do? He commits this heinous sin with Bathsheba and he's a man so, so passionate. When those passions are unrestrained, he'll do anything. He'll even murder a man. The guy's so passionate but when that passion is focused for the things of God it's a great tool and what did he do when God said no that's not what I've given you to do I don't want you to build it but I want your son to build it what did he do he said I'll spend every moment till I die doing everything I can to see that happen I'm going to pour my life into that Hey, you may never see things in your life you desire God to do, but they may happen in the lives of your kids. Are you going to get that excited and pour your life into that if it means you never see it? I hope one day we get this property like it's supposed to be. Are you going to be that excited about it even if you may pass off the scene before you ever see that happen? Hey, that family member that you're praying for, if they never get saved in your lifetime, are you still going to be willing to pray every day and spend time pouring your heart out to God if you never see it happen? David never saw it happen. But he poured his life into it 
as if it was going to happen tomorrow. He gave his whole heart and his life into it. And I'm going to challenge you today. If you're going to live the kind of life God intends you to have, you're going to have to be led by the Word of God. God's Word was David's authority. It trumped every idea he ever had. Does it in your life? Does it in mine? Let me hasten on to the third thing. One of the other preparations we need, we need to live in the ways of God. We need to live in the ways of God. Look at verse number 12, if you would, please. He admonishes there, he says, that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. See, David taught Solomon that the greatest thing that he could do with his life was to live for the Lord. And can I tell you, that's absolutely true today. The greatest thing you can do is live for God. The greatest thing you can do with your life is live for God. I'm not saying you have to be a missionary or a pastor or a preacher or anything like that. You can, you can be a plumber. You can be a, a, a mechanic. You can be a businessman, a businesswoman. You can work at a hospital and an insurance company. But whatever you do, the greatest thing you can do is to live for God where you are. Please God with your life, with your home, with your character, with your integrity, with your life. Please Him. That's the greatest thing you could do. And what David was trying to pass on to Solomon is this. It doesn't matter what great of a king you are. What matters the most is if you please God with your life. David learned that the hard way. It wasn't about power and prominence and preeminence. What was it about? It was about pleasing God. He wasted some time disobeying God. He wished he could go back and redo some things. And he's telling his son, I want to remind you that the greatest thing you can do with your life is to please God. Man, may God help us as Christian moms and dads to teach our kids, yeah, be successful, do your best in school, but why? Do that because it pleases God. Tie it to something greater than something they can graduate from or move away from or get out of. You need to teach them pleasing God is a lifelong ambition. It is the lifelong pursuit of a Christian. Pleasing God. You don't graduate that. You don't say, well, I'm 50 now. I don't have to please God anymore. No, every day, every moment, with what we have, when we have it. God, help me to please you today. Hey, do you think our life, our church, our world would be a little bit different if Christians made their primary uh, opportunity and obligation every day was just to please God? What they said, how they said it, to whom they said it, the way they dealt with situations in life and work, in their home. Do you think we'd all live a little bit different if we made pleasing God the absolute primary thing? Well, here's the thing. It's supposed to be. That's what God expects and intends of us. David's telling Solomon, listen, build God's house, but the most important thing and how glamorous you make that is that once that's built, you obey what he said. Why? What did Samuel tell Saul? To obey is better than sacrifice. How many times do the parents that should be a part of their kids' lives, and they're not because of ambition or success or whatever goals that they have, they feel like a way to compensate that is the, when they are around their kids, they they buy them expensive things or they take them to places they want to go and they fill that time with expenses. They, they want to show value by how much money they spend when really what a child wants is just time. You know, the truth is, more important than God wants you to be in His house and to dress up and to put a lot of money in an offering plate and give to the building fund, support missionaries, and tell somebody about Jesus. Most important thing that He really wants is for you to obey what he said. He doesn't care about how fancy you do what you do. He cares that you love him enough that you actually obey what he tells you to do. Not just on Sundays and Wednesdays, but every day. Every day. Notice these admonitions that David gave Solomon regarding this idea of being in the ways of God. The first thing he says in verse number 12, he mentions two things, wisdom and understanding. It was going to take both, because why? Because God's ways are going to require discipline. Following God's going to be, it's going to take discipline. It's going to take discipline to make the right decisions. Discipline to have a daily walk with Jesus Christ. It's always easier to do what's easiest. What's easiest is not always what's right. I've had to gather my three boys, three, five, and seven, and look at them eyeball to eyeball and say, listen, just because it's easy doesn't mean it's right. Sometimes you're going to have to do the right thing, and it's going to be the, one of the hardest things you've ever done. Telling the truth is hard. Even if it means it gets you into trouble, it's the right thing to do. And we're going to have to decide as a Christian not to just do what's always easiest, but what is right. And that is going to take discipline. It means I'm saying yes to God and no to me. 
It means I'm going to tell me what to do. That's what discipline is. I don't let me tell me what to do. I let me tell me what to do. Do you follow me, what I'm saying there? I don't let my attitudes and my feelings determine what I do, but I let my decider, my brain, my logical center that God gave me, my decision maker to say, no, I don't care how you feel. This is what's right. This is what I'm doing because that's what pleases God. It is going to take discipline to follow in the ways of God. He also says in verse number 13, be strong and of good courage. It's going to take courage. If you're going to go in the ways of God, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be frightening. You're going to have to have courage. Did you know that courage is not the absence of fear? Courage is doing what must be done while fear's there. It doesn't mean people who are courageous have no fear. It means in spite of the fear, they do it anyway. And I'll tell you, there's been times when I've had to follow God with me and my family, and I was terrified, but I knew that's what God wanted me to do, and I did it anyway. Sometimes fear can keep us back, and God says, in spite of that fear, I want you to show me how much you're determined to obey me. I want you to show me how much you're going to do what's right, even when it's not even easy, especially when it's not easy. What, what value if it, if, is it is, if it is easy? Everybody would be doing it if it was easy. Everybody follow the ways of God if it was easy. Huh, no ramifications? Absolutely, I'll do that. I mean, don't we do that when somebody says, Hey, if you go there, you get something for free. No, come on. Strings at that? No, no, they'll give it to you free. You go, yeah, I'm going by there. What have I got to lose? And most people want to follow God that way. Hey, is that easy? Nope. Nah, I'm out. That's a good thought, but I think I'll pass on that. It's going to take discipline. It's going to take courage. Look at verse number 14. David tells Solomon, thou mayest add thereto. I'll tell you, if we follow the ways of God, it's going to take work. I cannot live my life of faith on the faith of my parents, on the faith of my pastor, on the faith of my church family. My Christian life, if I am going to walk in the ways of God, it's going to take me working to do that in my own life. I think too many Christians are following on the faith of somebody else. That's why when they leave home, their faith crumbles and just sort of implodes because they never developed it for themselves. They were an extension of someone else's faith life. Well, we went to church because mom took us to church. But when mommy doesn't take us to church anymore, church is out. Oh, we, we read our Bible as a family. But when you're all alone, you don't read your Bible anymore. Oh, we used to go witnessing. We'd all go together out on soul winning and visitation on Thursday mornings, Thursday nights, and Saturdays. But when that's not around, you don't go anymore. I gotta tell you, if you're going to walk in the ways of God, it's going to take work. You have to work. What does the Bible say? Add to your faith. Why was the Lord so disappointed in the stewards when He came back? Because they lost what they gave Him? What he gave them? No. Because they did nothing with it. I'm terrified that many Christians are going to stand before God and God's going to say, what would you do with the salvation I gave you? And the answer is really simple and clear. Nothing. No return. No growth. No development. It's like, it's like a construction site where they didn't even break ground. What'd you do? Nothing. David was telling Solomon, listen, before you pass off the scene, love the house of God. Be led by the Word of God. Get in on the ways of God, and I'll leave you with this lastly, labor for the work of God. He closes out the chapter, labor for the work of God. Look at verse number 16, arise therefore and be doing. Man, that's a good verse for a lot of people today, arise and be doing. Do what? Do something. Do anything. Get involved. Hey, the Christian life is not a spectator sport. Did you know God says that we're all servants, good or bad? You're either a good one or a bad one. If you're not serving, you're not a servant. Are you involved? Are you in? Are you laboring? Are you working? Are you pouring your life and your effort and your talents and your abilities into the things of God? Verse number 18 says, Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord. Arise 
and build, he says. Can I tell us today as members of First Baptist Church, God has blessed us to be a blessing. The property we have, the finances we've been given, the way God's prospered you, blessed you, given you things in your life that's to be used for Him. Not to sit on and to enjoy and to benefit from personally. Those are things that He has made us stewards of for Him. To labor for Him. To use for Him. It's like your boss giving you $10,000 and says, I expect you to invest this for me. You don't run out and blow it all. Why? That's not yours. It's the boss's. But how many things have God given you and I? And what do we do? We blow them all. Blow it all. Waste our health, our resources, our abilities, our talents. We waste our time. We waste our opportunities. We blow it all. And never one time think about pouring that into the work of God. Hey, why are you at First Baptist Church? Is it to get something or to give it? You know what God's desire is? He does the giving when we give it to Him. God blesses us when we use what He's given us for His work. We get involved in what He has going on. I want us to remember that where God's presence is is a great privilege and great responsibility. Notice, notice in verse number 19, God's Word says that this is a sudden work. I, you hear a lot of people say this, well, when I retire, I'm going to serve God. When my kids are out of my home, I'm going to do that. You know, it's always down the road, you know. I got good intentions, preacher. <laughs> when my health improves, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, 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 I'm gonna, gonna, gonna. I'm gonna one day, I'm gonna this, I'm gonna that. One of these days, I'll be an astronaut. You, you, know, you can say anything you want down the road. But here's the key. When does God want us to do it? Look at, look at verse number 19. What does it say? When does God want us to do it? Now! Now! Uh, one of these days, no, now! When it's difficult, now! When it's maybe a little bit crowded for time, yeah, now! Well, well, what if my finances aren't as large as I'd prefer them to be? Now, 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 God says. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. All we have is right now. Come back tonight and surrender your life to God. No, do it now. Man, if you've ever had a desire to do something for God, you better do it now. If you've, ever had to, if you've ever wanted to put money into the work of God, you better do it now. If you've ever wanted to influence somebody for God, you better do it now. Now. God says this is a sudden work. You can't sit on this, Solomon. Now. Get busy. Get up and build. But look at verse number 19 again. It's not only a sudden work, it's a shared work. He said, set your hearts to seek the Lord. I'm thankful that what God asks us to do as Christians, He doesn't ask us to do it alone. He doesn't say, this is all on you. It's all on you. If you mess up, it's going to mess up everything. No, He says that we need to set our hearts and our souls. This idea to set means to give or to devote it. And this, uh, this is talking about our heart and our soul, our, our passions. It reminds me of Colossians 3, 2, set your affections on things above. Our passions need to be in working for the Lord. You ever did something you enjoyed doing and it didn't seem like work? <laughs> I, I laugh when people say, man, I hate work. Work's hard. <laughs> I thought, well, if it was fun, they would call it fun, not work. I'm going to fun today. Woo! You know? No, I'm going to work. <laughs> Pray for me. You're so happy, what happened? I got off work! Ah! <laughs> Nobody's like, what's wrong with you? I'm going on vacation. I got time off. No, I've, ne I've never seen anybody that way. <laughs> what happened? Now well, my boss gave me an extra week off. Uh, can't believe it. No, it's like, see ya, suckers! Ah! <laughs> you know, and you're giving, making faces and everything. I'm out of here! Ah! Yeah, why? We just feel like there's a weight that's been removed. This is awesome. I can do whatever I want to do when I want to do it. This is great. Can I tell you, when you love the Lord and you serve Him with the things He's given you to do for Him the way He intended, can I tell you, it's not a drudgery. You'll become passionate about it. doesn't mean it's not hard, but what it means is, is that you... 
experience of fulfillment that only God can give you for doing what He wants you to do the way He wants you to do it. And David told Solomon, you need to set your heart and your soul, set it on that. And then we need to seek the Lord. Verse number 19, seek the Lord. I end with this. That, that word seeking gives the idea of treading a place. That's what I'm saying. We can't do this alone. You ever seen a path in the woods that have been tread? A trail, somebody's... It just means people have walked it a lot. Grass doesn't grow there anymore. Can I tell you, that's what David said. David said, in this work that God's given you to do, you need to seek God. He said it needs to be something that's so regular, it's like wearing a path out in the woods. Can I tell you what you and I need? We need God. Man, how are you going to be a parent? The kind of parent you need to be, you ought to be without God. How are you going to be the Christian that God expects you to be without Him? How are you going to be the kind of church member that you want to be and you ought to be without God? How are you going to serve Him and do something for Him without Him? <laughs> How are you going to stay right without God? How are you going to have the right leading in your life without God? How are you going to make the right decisions without God? How are you going to have the right kind of desires without God? David's saying, you need to seek Him. When? All the time. Every time. Wear a path to God. Tread a place. Mark it out. There needs to be something in our life, in the life of a Christian, that on the day of our death, there needs to be a clear line that runs through our life. And it is the tread out path to God. Where every day we walk to God. Every moment we walk to God. Every time we had a chance, we walked to God. And the sad thing is most Christians frequent it a few times a year every once in a while and we wonder why things in our life don't seem to work out the way we think God says they ought to. And David's telling his son love the house of God. When he says something to you, do what he says. Pour your life into it. Give it all you've got. The sad thing is he didn't. If you Go all the way and fast forward to the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, hey, there's no profit in the grave that we're going to. Whatever you've got to do, you better give it your all today because you, when you go to the grave, it's done. It's over. Pour your passions and your life into what God tells you to do. Get into the ways of God. Oh, it's going to take some discipline. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some courage today. This is not a mamby-pamby kind of lifestyle to please God. You're going to have people mock you and belittle you, and you're going to be the weirdo, and you're going to be the outsider. What did happen? If they hated Jesus, they're going to hate you. Hey, I like how one person said it. If you're going to get in the ring, you need to expect somebody to throw some punches. And if you're going to obey the ways of God, you're going to expect somebody to not like it or you sometimes. But what do we need to do with our life? Labor in the work of God. Pour your life into it. And seek Him. Hey, when's the last time we, we sought God? Hey, hey, not, hey, not when we needed something, but to seek Him because not something from Him, but we just needed Him. Oh God, I need wisdom. See, you're not really seeking God. You just want what He's got. Oh, God, I got this bill that needs to be paid. You just want his stuff. When's the last time we sought God for God? God, I need you. I want you. Not your stuff. I want you. Let me ask you this morning. Do you love the house of God? Are you led by His Word? Are you disciplined and living courageous, courageously in His ways today? Or are you involved in His work? Hey, 
the day is coming where you can no longer prepare. Have you made these preparations today in your life? Let's pray together.